Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second event of the Telecamp Talk Series. I'm Rachel Jacob, Program Manager at Telecamp. And here with me on screen is Marek, co-founder and CTO of Celo, and Josh, developer relations engineer at C Lab, who you'll hear from both shortly. Hi, Marek. Hi, Josh. Hey. Thanks You're welcome. Me. Before we do get started with today's talk, I'd like to briefly speak about Cell Camp and what's ahead. We're currently a week and a half away from the application deadline for our two-month virtual acceleration program and startup competition, where teams will receive mentorship from industry leaders, business and technological guidance, and a chance to win prizes amounting to 30,000 USD. The focus of Cell Camp is to help startups and developers build sustainable businesses on Celo. So the deadline to apply to Celo Camp is October 5th, and I highly encourage you all to visit celocamp.com for more information and to apply today. So in today's talk, you'll have a chance to ask your questions regarding the Celo platform and how to build on Celo. And towards the end of our session, you'll also hear from Josh on an introduction to Celo developer tools and helpful resources to start building. So definitely stick around for that. I'd also like to note that on the bottom of the screen, there's an ask a question tab. You can ask questions there all throughout the talk and also vote on questions you'd like either Mark or Josh to answer. Just to uh, give you a brief background of why we're so lucky to have the opportunity to speak to Mark today. Mark is a co-founder and CTO of Cello. He also co-founded a machine learning startup called Loku that spun out of MIT and was later acquired by GoDaddy. At GoDaddy, Mark was VP of engineering. And uh, as a professional researcher, Mark's past work includes work on deterministic multi-threading and transactional memory for which he received a 2011 Facebook fellowship. He also previously worked at Google, Microsoft Research and Sun Labs and received his PhD from MIT. So Mark, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm gonna pass the floor on to you. Thanks so much. Um, awesome. Well, it's really great to be here. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I figured for uh, for this kind of AMA, it might make sense to just to go through a few quick slides, um, giving you a quick um, kind of introduction to to Cello, and then we can kind of jump into into any questions that people have. Uh, so let me just quickly uh, bring that up right now. Give me one second. Can you see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I think by now, hopefully, you know that uh, Celo is a permissionless platform that makes financial tools accessible uh, to anybody uh, with a mobile phone. Um, and I think you know what makes Celo a little, I think, unique in the space. You know, there's a lot of different layer ones out there right now, especially launching this year. Um, you know, I think what makes Celo particularly unique is the the full stack approach that it took to kind of developing not just the blockchain, but um, the, the Celo SDK that the app developers use to, to build on Celo, and then our flagship uh, mobile application, uh, Valora, uh, which is a really easy to use mobile wallet. And you know, we really took inspiration from uh, how uh, things are done at Apple. You know, Apple is, uh, is well known for developing kind of software and hardware at the same time. Uh, allowing it to create kind of unique experiences that, that are difficult to replicate if you're just building um, both on both sides of the stack in isolation. And so we wanted to replicate that in, in kind of the blockchain space. And so as we built the, the platform, we, we built Valora and any, um, uh, any learnings that we had from that experience, we put into uh, furthering the actual platform itself to make it uh, easier to, to build on top of. Uh, and the end result is, you know, we, we built something that we think is um, 
really, really quite compelling, especially if you're looking to build on mobile. And so, um, you know, you might be asking, you know, why uh, should we build on Celo? You know, there's a lot of different layer ones out there. Um, and really, when people ask me this question, um, I usually kind of respond with this chart. Um, this is showing you the number of uh, mobile devices with active uh, mobile subscriptions in the world um, as determined by the Ericsson Mobility Report. Uh, everything before kind of 2020 um, is kind of based on past data and everything uh, to the right of that is, is a projection by the Ericsson Mobility, Mobility Report. And it's pretty exciting to see. Um, last year, we crossed 8 billion um, kind of active mobile devices in the world. Uh, and this year, we crossed 6 billion active smartphones uh, in the world. That is just a staggering, staggering number. And um, what's even more, I think, exciting is if you look all the way to 2025 uh, on the right, you can see that you know connectivity is improving uh, a lot, and by 2025, um, all but 17% of people will have um, access to LTE or 5G uh, connectivity, which is just really, really exciting to see. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, we, we built Valora. Valora is um, kind of our, as I mentioned before, our kind of flagship mobile wallet. Um, and it makes it just really, really easy uh, to send and receive um, kind of value in, in a fully permissionless manner. And so we, we tried really hard to recreate the user experience of things like Venmo or, or PayPal, um, but in a fully permissionless manner. And the reason we were able to do that is because of kind of three really exciting technical innovations on the platform. Um, number one, Celo has kind of a built-in stablecoin platform um, that uh, allows the Celo community to launch new stablecoins that are all backed by the same uh, over-collateralized crypto asset reserve. And, and I think critically, uh, and this is also unique to Celo, uh, you can actually pay for transaction fees with these assets. And, um, you know, that uh, creates this nice user experience. If you want to send some Celo dollars to a friend, you can pay for that transaction fee in Celo dollars. Um, and um, this feature is actually available to any ERC20-like token on, uh, on Celo. So if you're thinking of adding a token to the platform, uh, then through on-chain governance, you can get it whitelisted for use as a, as a gas currency um, so that people can pay for transaction fees with it, which is just really, really um, makes things really, really easy. Uh, next, you can send currency to phone numbers. Um, this is something that is also, uh, I think, very unique to us and something that came out of this full stack approach that we took. Um, if you, and this really, I think from a usability perspective is really nice. So if we go back um, and, um, and look at kind of this home screen, you can see that there's names here on these transactions. Those names are coming from your contact list um, because um, when you're sending these payments, you're sending them to phone numbers and then you can map those phone numbers to contacts in your phone allowing you to see names, allowing you to see profile photos, uh, all in kind of a, a kind of privacy preserving permissionless manner. And I think really critically, uh, if you want to send the payment to someone who hasn't yet signed up, you know, on Bitcoin, on Ethereum, you can't do that right now. Uh, you need a public private key pair or this recipient needs a public private key pair. And um, one of the things that this design uh, allows us to do on Celo is to actually enable that flow. So you can send the payment to someone before they sign up and, uh, uh, and then they can, the funds go to an escrow smart contract and then they can redeem those funds when they verify their phone number in, in a fully kind of permissionless manner using the platform. Uh, and then finally, I think no, um, 
no um, mobile first approach uh, in, in the space would be complete without a, a very efficient like client. And so Cello has a, a really efficient like client um, that uses kind of three uh, kind of new innovations. Uh, number one, uh, Cello uses epoch based syncing, which means that um, in the proof of stake protocol, the validator set can only change once per day. Uh, and this allows like clients to only have to download one header per day in order to sync. Uh, and so this gives us a, a really big uh, speed up already. Um, we use BLS signature aggregation, which is another interesting technique for uh, aggregating lots of signatures into a single kind of multi-sig that's of constant size. Uh, that gives us a nice big um, speed up as well. Um, and then since uh, we wanted really the experience to be extremely snappy for anybody opening up a mobile device, um, um, uh, we wanted them to be able to sync with the chain near instantly. We worked really hard to incorporate uh, ZK Snarks as well into the whole system. So with ZK Snarks, you can create these non-interactive proofs that prove some arbitrary computation. And so in our case, we can prove kind of the like client computation. And then uh, a, a like client can simply uh, download this proof, verify it in constant time, and then be off to the races. Um, and so this is using kind of the Plumo part of Celo, which uh, is coming soon, which is really exciting. Um, another thing that frequently comes up, it came up last uh, in the last cohort, people are asking about kind of Celo scalability. Uh, and, um, you know, it makes sense if you're looking on Ethereum, you're seeing um, high gas prices, you're seeing a lot of transactions that take forever to get mined. It's not a great environment to be building a DAP or to be you know, building products on top of. Um, and so the good news is that Celo um, is, uh, is proof of stake based and it has a very fast proof of stake protocol, consensus protocol. Um, in effect, um, we have people lock up uh, some Celo and then uh, use that Celo to vote for validators. Uh, and uh, and then those validators perform PBFT consensus, which is which can be very very uh, quick, um, and so this allows very short block times. Right now we're starting with five second block times, but we can we can actually shorten that over time. Um, and then you know we touched upon the like client. It turns out that like clients are actually very relevant to scalability as well. Um, if you look at this chart, this is kind of from earlier this year. Uh, showing you what the kind of Bitcoin and Ethereum chain sizes are. Um, it, if you were to increase the, the kind of throughput of the Ethereum network, um, then, then this chain would grow and kind of a, at a faster clip. Uh, and that's problematic to people who want to kind of participate in running the protocol, especially uh, full nodes. Um, downloading 337 gigabytes and then processing every transaction since the beginning of the network. That's a lot of effort just to just to kind of join the network. And so Ethereum has this kind of thing called fast sync, where you only download the headers and then uh, and the actual um, current storage try from someone else, and then you verify that that try is correct by checking uh, all of the headers using the like client protocol. But on Ethereum, the like client protocol still requires you to download five gigs of data um, just to get to the current most recent header. And so imagine if, if Ethereum had, I don't know, shorter block periods, say it was 100 times more scalable, uh, then you know, those five gigs of, of headers could become 500 gigs of headers. That's clearly too much to download um, from someone joining the network even using this, this so-called fast mode. And so having a very efficient like client, it turns out is actually really important for scalability as well. Uh, and so um, it's another big, big win for Celo. And then the final thing that frequently comes up, one reason that Ethereum doesn't increase their block size is because they're, you know, they're looking at this chart and they're worried that these full nodes just will leave the, the platform 
um, and uh, and that's a shame because um, you know it, it really limits the amount of uh, kind of decentralization that exists in the community, um, and so um, and it just becomes more and more expensive to operate these full nodes. Uh, the more and more uh, chain data there is, uh, and so Celo addresses this by creating kind of full node incentives. Uh, in effect, you can actually make money by running a full node uh, by servicing like clients. And the way you do that is by getting a cut of the transaction fees uh, that these like clients are creating. Uh, and so if you forward a transaction from a like client to the to the peer to peer kind of network, you can make some money. Um, and that's um, really, um, you know, it's a, it's a new and interesting way of addressing this issue around scalability uh, and the balance of decentralization. Um, you know, I mentioned um, that we're working on kind of Plumo. Uh, I figured it might be interesting for folks if they're interested to see what's next in Q4. Um, we can talk about this more in the in the AMA. Um, and then, you know, I think many people are probably also interested in, in how to build on Celo. Uh, and so Josh uh, can talk more about that in a bit. Um, but, you know, definitely big um, call out to kind of docs.celo.org where, where you can see uh, a lot of our documentation. Uh, and so with that, yeah, just wanted to thank you and uh, turn it over to the kind of AMA portion of this session. All right, thank you, Marek. Okay, so um, I see that we have a bunch of questions coming in already. And um, the first one is, is it possible to use Solidity to write and deploy smart contracts on Celo? Yeah, excellent question. Um, and that's one thing that I didn't mention uh, just now. Uh, Celo is fully EVM compatible. It's actually implemented um, as a fork of Go Ethereum. Uh, and so this means that down to the last hard, hard fork, um, Celo is, um, uh, supports everything that you can do on, on Ethereum. So that means absolutely you can use Solidity, you can deploy Solidity smart contracts. Uh, and you know there pretty much isn't uh, any feature uh, that you might be used to on Ethereum that isn't supported on Celo. And I think this is in stark contrast to some other Kind of new layer ones that are claiming solidity support but when you look under the covers you realize that they're um, either interpreting uh, the evm uh, inside another evm so it becomes kind of slow um, or that you don't support the same signature schemes and the same type of cryptography uh, and so with cello uh, you get a hundred percent compatibility and we worked really hard to, to ensure that and we're working really hard to ensure that that continues in the future with subsequent Ethereum hard forks. Our next question is, are there any NFT projects launched on Celo? Yeah, great question. Um, so I know that there are um, some gaming companies that are building on Celo right now. Um, and um, you know there are ones that are focused really on the mobile use case, um, and so I think they have some NFTs kind of built in to those games. Uh, but in terms of an M NFT platform, I think Josh, maybe you've come across something like that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've seen it. Yet. Yeah, I know there are teams working on like exploring NFTs and what they would look like on Celo, um, and it's very similar, like Mary said, to what the, they're like on Ethereum, but I don't know of any projects that are actually launched on Celo currently on Celo mainnet, so. Yeah. All right, for our third question, how will Celo be faster and cheaper than Ethereum? Yeah, really excellent question. Um, and so I think it really comes down to that consensus protocol um, that I just kind of um, well, glossed over real quick. Um, by using proof of stake, um, you can have much, much shorter block times than uh, you can with uh, proof of work. Uh, and then by having 
um, a really efficient like client protocol, you can have bigger blocks than Ethereum um, because it becomes easier for full nodes to sync with the chain to come and go from the network. Um, and then, um, uh, and then finally, because Celo has full node incentives, you have kind of another uh, incentive for full nodes to stick around, even as the chain data grows significantly. Uh, and so the answer is, you know, we can we can beat Ethereum simply by having more frequent blocks and bigger blocks, uh, and we can do that uh, because we have uh, all of this interesting work that um, still maintains decentralization even in the presence of of those bigger blocks and more frequent blocks. And this actually means that it's quite easy for us, um, even though we launched with fairly conservative um, uh, kind of throughput uh, numbers to begin with, it's actually quite easy for us to increase um, the block size and to decrease the block time such that we can get to kind of visa scale uh, throughput. And so if you're um, interested in doing something that requires you know a lot of transactions per second you know i think um definitely highly recommend solo over something like ethereum um like we've we've thought really hard uh, and long to to make the scalability kind of be there and perform for you at, as and when your your throughput grows um so can we expect an API for the Valora wallet that would allow merchants to generate invoices for unique users, much similar to the Coinbase API? Yeah, it's a really great question. So is that um, um, something like the Coinbase Commerce API? Is that, um, is that what you're referring to? Um, Mario, if you want, you can comment on there and uh, elaborate on your question. Um, if so, um, you know, I think the answer is, you know, yes, we, we want this. Uh, in fact, um, we're kicking off kind of a community hackathon today. Uh, and one of the ideas that I wanted to pitch and actually work on this week uh, is to build a Stripe-like um, API for Celo. So similar to Coinbase Commerce, but, but something that also allows subscriptions and um, you know, all the all the awesome things that, that Stripe offers. So I think it's coming. Um, of course, one of the last um, Cello Camp um, cohort participants, uh, MugglePay, also has been working hard on, on this particular problem as well. So I highly recommend checking them out as well. For our next question, is the mobile number identity tied to specific operators, or rather, is it agnostic? Um, yeah. So the identity protocol is built um, at the platform layer, which means that it's both agnostic to kind of the wallet that someone's using uh, and to the, the operator that they're using. Um, and, and this is really cool, right? This means that it doesn't matter which wallet someone's using, doesn't matter which country they're in, if they have access to a phone number that they can receive text messages to, uh, they can verify their phone number and, um, and make it so that other people can find them really easily by their phone number. Um, and this is why um, actually if some telcos are, are exploring building on top of Celo, Right now, um, you know, I think telcos do a lot of things with phone numbers as identifiers, and so, um, you know, it's it's definitely a very compelling feature of the platform. So, for our next question, um, I want to run Aragon for voting about money. Voting in Mainnet is somehow too expensive. Celo, Fuse, or Matic is the best platform for this. Why? Um, I'm going to try to open that question and uh, see if I can grok it better. Um, hmm. So there's a question. Can you run something on Celo or do you need to use a layer two? 
to to run um, this particular kind of set of voting operations? Is that the question? Uh, Victor, you can comment on your question if you'd like. We can also move on to the next one. And then once he comments, we can go back to it. Sounds good. OK, so um, the next question, what Oracle frameworks are available to developers with Velo? Are there any plans for a partnership integration between Chainlink and Velo? Yeah, really great question. Um, so, uh, so absolutely, I think Chainlink is um, uh, excited about our platform, and you know has um, um, had talked to us about bringing their Oracle service onto the platform. Um, I think it's very, very interesting. I think um, I think it will happen eventually, and so highly recommend lobbying them to, to make that happen. Uh, Band Protocol is another one of these that uh, last year even created um, uh, a bunch of oracles that they maintained for Cello Camp uh, participants. Uh, so I should say in the last cohort. Um, and so that's another option. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Rachel, if they're also participating this year, you know, or this cohort. Um, band, I believe so. Yeah, so um, so they're another really great option. Um, and then uh, Celo also maintains its own uh, Oracle for its stability mechanism uh, that brings the price of Celo on chain. Uh, and so if you're interested in building a DAP that needs the price of Celo, then um, you know you get that for free already on the platform. So yeah, in short, there's a Celo Oracle, there's a band protocol, which uh, is participating uh, in, uh, in this cohort uh, as uh, a service for, um, for Celo Camp participants. And then I think uh, Chainlink, um, will hopefully come at some point in the future as well. So as uh, Alon commented, um, Band is an official partner of the camp. So they will definitely right. be joining us. OK, so for our next question, what is Cello's goal? Oh, it just disappeared. <laughs> um, I don't know where that one went, so we'll have to go to the next one. How does CUSD work in regards to legal laws? Um, let me read that question again. Uh, how does CUSC work in regards to legal laws? Yeah, great question. Um, so, um, so CUSD is stable, uh, which means that it, um, in most juris jurisdictions, does not look like a security. Uh, so a lot of the kind of securities related uh, laws that um, typically have kind of um, been a concern for crypto projects uh, aren't aren't applicable. Um, and so that's that's really good news for people using CUSD. Um, of course, there are money transmission and um, you know, uh, laws and uh, guidelines by FATF uh, that the US puts out, which then many countries uh, go ahead and, and implement. Um, and if you read um, you know, those guidelines, um, then um, in most countries right now, if you have a unhosted wallet, uh, which um, is you know, um, like the Valora wallet or, um, or any other wallet that um, kind of maintains uh, the keys for you in a, in a non-custodial way, uh, those wallets uh, are exempt from your typical kind of money transmission kind of obligations and, and laws. And so right now, uh, you're free in, in most legal jurisdictions to to use something like CUSD uh, and, and transact freely uh, and build um, kind of projects and businesses on top of it without without the need for for those extra you know, requirements that exist in in kind of the more traditional uh, either e-money or just fiat kind of world 
now, of course, you know, things could change in the future and, you know, we're constantly um, um, looking at the kind of guidelines that FADF and FinCEN are putting out. Uh, we have a really great head of uh, compliance uh, who, who even is based out in DC and is even um, kind of talking to, to those regulators and, um, um, and even giving feedback for kind of future directions that they may take. Uh, and so, yeah, if there's any kind of update, then then I think we'll, we'll definitely let folks know. But right now, I think, um, yeah, in most legal jurisdictions, we're in the clear. Um, and then I think there was a follow-up about the SEC treating all tokens like securities, uh, which doesn't work well for stable coins. Um, you know, I think everyone has to kind of uh take their uh, own risk assessment of this um but you know um there's now uh, a lot of compelling evidence that cello itself is not a security and uh, ncusd uh being a stable coin uh likewise um and uh and so yeah i think um yeah i'm not sure where you're getting your, your information from but i would definitely double check that So for our next question, it's from Marco. Oh, they keep on disappearing because <laughs> they're being voted on. Um, when will it be possible to earn interest on CUSD? I lost it again. <laughs> yeah, really great. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really great question. Um, the the easiest way to earn interest in CUSD is to have a kind of a healthy lending um, marketplace on Cello where people can lend out CUSD and other people can borrow CUSD and maybe collateralize it with Cello. Uh, we're, we've seen some of that work out in kind of the DeFi space on Ethereum, um, and there's some really compelling um, projects on on Ethereum that that we're chatting with that, you know, uh, might in the future launch on Celo. Um, and, you know, I think that could be a, a point in time when, when you'd be able to do this. Of course, if anybody here is interested in, in building that marketplace, um, you know, that's a, a really exciting and massive opportunity as well. Uh, and so uh, definitely encourage people to think about that. Um, but um, but yeah, I think in general, um, we're you know we built a platform, we built a mobile app and the SDK, uh, but we can't build every kind of use case uh, that we want to see uh, on on top of Celo. Um And so um, you know this is really an opportunity for everyone here to uh, yeah to think about you know whether or not that this is a compelling. Um, product to bring to to billions of mobile phones worldwide, and I would imagine the answer to that is yes. For our next question, if uh, Cello uses SMS to verify phone numbers, how how vulnerable is it to SIM swap or social engineering attacks at mobile operators? Yeah, really great question. Um, so I think the answer is that it's um, you know as vulnerable as uh, every other centralized app that uses uh, these these services. Um, but um, because these things are well known, we worked really hard to make sure that your funds. Uh, are never at risk if someone steals your phone number and, and verifies your your phone number. Um, so your funds are always secured with uh, a private key that is generated uh, and lives in the secure enclave on your phone. And so even if someone SIM swaps you, uh, at most they can try to impersonate you going forward. They can't spend your existing funds. Uh, but even there, we worked hard if we notice that there's two accounts tied to the same phone number because someone stole your phone number and then registered a new account, then we warn users sending you money. 
so that uh, you are um, uh, less likely, so that that type of attack is less likely to succeed. Um, and so, yeah, we, we worked hard to, to make it so that uh, our customers' funds are, are always, um, or I should say, um, Valora users' funds are always um, are always safe, even if someone were to steal your phone number. So our next question, can we full transfer an ERC20 token to Celo blockchain and build smart, smart contracts for exchange data with Chainlink also? Okay, I'm going to take a look at that question again. Uh, can we transfer an ERC20 token to the Celo blockchain and build smart contracts for exchanging data with Chainlink? Um, so I think for the first part of that question, um, the answer is soon. Um, so maybe some folks have seen this. Uh, Celo um, or C Labs uh, acquired um, uh, a company called Suma which has been thinking about and building bridges uh, for, for a number of years now. They're one of the leading kind of experts in, in this space. Uh, and, and that team now is, is working on uh, creating a bridge to Ethereum. Uh, I mentioned that we have a hard fork coming up. Uh, one of the things in that hard fork will be to introduce um, some precompiles that will make it easier for us to, to complete that bridge. Once our bridge is complete, um, you'll be able to move ERC20 tokens over from Ethereum onto Celo. Uh, and um, I think one thing that is uh, pretty exciting, at least for me, is that we can make this bridge work in a, in a trustless capacity. Um, one of the nice things about having a very efficient light client is that you can actually run that light client code in a smart contract. Uh, which then uh, means that you don't have to kind of trust uh, any third party to kind of custody your assets for you as you kind of move them over. Um, and so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, I think it'll probably take um, something close to half a year before we launch that, but, uh, but we're working really, really hard to make that happen soon. So for our next question, um, can you guys talk more about the variation of POS that you're using and what are the possible attack vectors there? What's the number of voting validators and how do you make sure that there are no conspiracies and alliances amongst validators? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, you can think of Sela's proof of stake protocol as maybe a hybrid between Cosmos and what uh, Polkadot is doing. So in Cosmos, you vote for kind of um, uh, on the order of a hundred validators, and then based on how many votes each of these validators got, that determines the weight that the validators have in in the PBFT consensus. And so long as um, no more than uh, two thirds of um, the overall you know, weighted um, kind of validators are colluding, then the network has um, kind of safety guarantees and um, um, those colluding parties won't be able to kind of create a fork or roll back transactions or do other things similar to kind of the 51% kind of threshold for proof of work. Um, now, uh, in, um, in parity, it's, I think, similar, but you, uh, you pick multiple um, validators, uh, and then the end result is that each validator has the same kind of weight. Uh, and so the idea is that um, there's this um, kind of interesting optimization function that they use to uh, to accomplish that. But the end result is that um, you have to go out there and find kind of multiple validators that you trust uh, and you think would be uh, kind of honest and would work well in, in the ecosystem. And so we thought that um, 
yeah, both of these approaches had some downsides. And so where we settled on instead is we like the idea of having every validator have equal weight. I think that promotes decentralization that uh, makes it less likely that a small number of parties can uh, get up to that 67% weight. Um, and so the way we do this is we added an extra level of indirection um, instead of voting for validators, you vote for validator groups. Validator groups then uh, add multiple validators to their group. Uh, and then we use the Hans algorithm, which is kind of a, a well-known election algorithm, uh, to, to then elect those validators from the votes on these validator groups. Um, and the nice thing about this is, is you can actually uh, make uh, validator groups um, do some of the kind of due diligence on these validators uh, to make it uh, less onerous for, for people voting. Um, and, and then finally, I think the, uh, the way that all of these proof of stake networks really incentivize against kind of two thirds of validators colluding together uh, is by having a pretty big stick uh, that they employ if these folks were to do this. Um, and this is something that doesn't exist in proof of work networks. If two thirds of validators were to collude and were to create a, a new fork, maybe to, to do a double spend attack, uh, then that fork would be easily detected and um, uh, those validators would get slashed. Um, and so they would have a, a pretty expensive cost associated with it. Um, and so this is kind of the big argument in proof of stake networks as to why they're more secure than proof of work networks. You have both positive incentives, so people make money by participating in the protocol going forward, but you also have negative incentives if they misbehave. And by having this extra level of indirection, having these validator groups, uh, we can actually make validator groups um, bond their cello for much longer periods of time than would be reasonable to ask for a just a regular validator. Uh, and this means that they are on the hook for a longer period of time if someone misbehaves. Um, and so they really have a, a really strong incentive to, uh, if they're running their own validators, not misbehave, and if they're taking on other validators into their group to really vet them properly. Uh, so right now, the unbonding time for validator groups is half a year. Uh, I think that's the longest kind of um, subjectivity window uh, of any proof of state chain right now. Um, and um, again, this really makes that stick uh, really quite effective, um, which, uh, yeah, is, is kind of the main incentive for people not to collude. So for our next question, our current DAP supports Ethereum mainnet via web3.js. Thinking about cello support, do you think maintaining a single DAP for both networks does make sense? Or would it be easier to maintain a fork to make better use of all of cello's enhancements? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think it probably depends uh, on the DAP and, and Josh, feel free to chime in here as well. Um, I think if you could benefit from Celo stable currencies, uh, or if you could benefit from having your transaction fees be covered by uh, an ERC-20 token instead of, um, kind of the native asset on both Ethereum and Celo, uh, then maybe there could be some incentives to um, do something um, bespoke for Celo. Um, but if you're not doing those things, uh, then it's probably fine to keep the same code base and, and just deploy on both. Um, Celo has its own, or Celo supports Web3 and, and has a uh, provider that you can kind of inject that um, uh, allows you to um to be able to sign transactions locally as well if that's important to you uh so so i think you should be you should be able to kind of keep the same code base pretty easily um the one thing i might add though is that you know maybe the code the kind of solidity um 
side of things might say the same, but if you uh, are building kind of a web app for people to access uh, that kind of DAP, uh, I might encourage you to consider building a mobile application as well um, using kind of DAP Kit. Uh, and the reason for that is um, you'll uh, have access to a lot more potential customers um, and uh, kind of the potential to reach those 6 billion smartphones. Uh, and arguably, depending on what your DAP does, it could be that the people on mobile devices may find uh, your work more valuable. Um, and so um, DAP Kit is built uh, in mind with people who are moving from kind of the traditional web app space. And so it uses something called Expo, which makes it quite easy to build uh, native applications uh, using um, kind of React and standard web kind of frameworks. And so definitely encourage you to check that out. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, our contract kit does include Web3.js um, in the package. So um, because Celo and Ethereum are so similar, um, if your engineers are experienced developing on Ethereum, um, it can be relatively, well, it is easy to deploy onto Celo. Um, and as Merrick said, depending on what your DAP is doing, it may make sense to just have a different deployment flow for Celo um, versus Ethereum. And then um, one of the bigger differences is how users are um, probably going to interact with, with Celo. Um, we're mobile first. So yeah, as Merrick said, the DAP kit is built to help people access the blockchain through mobile experience. And I think that's something that Ethereum doesn't do very well. Um, so if you're building a mobile DAP, it would make sense to fork. So that's actually all the time we have for questions because I would love uh, for Josh um, to turn the floor over to you uh, to speak about Celo developer tools. Mark, thank you so much for um, you know answering all these great questions, really great questions with uh, wonderful answers as well. So I'm gonna, Josh, you don't have any slides, right? Oh. I'm just gonna share a sheet. Um, in the share chat. a sheet, okay. Yep, mm -hmm. and this is just a sheet I put together um, with a lot of the developer tools. Some of them we've mentioned, some of them I'll just introduce, um, but there's links to the docs or like relevant um, relevant info in the sheet. So I'm just gonna like talk through these things. Um, and then if you guys have any questions about any of these tools, uh, feel free to join the Discord at chat.cello.org and Merrick and I are both on there regularly. Um, and if your questions didn't get answered, um, yeah, feel free to ask in Discord because we have a lot of our engineers hang out there too. So um, we'll, we'll answer those. So yeah, just jumping into the developer tools. And um, we mentioned Contract Kit a few times. Um, Contract Kit is a JavaScript package of Celo blockchain utilities. So it helps, uh, helps you manage connections to the Celo blockchain, manage accounts, um, send transactions, and interact with smart contracts. And we also have a set of wrappers around our core um, protocol smart contracts that these are mostly related to governance, um, validator actions, our on-chain exchange with CUSD and Celo, things like that. Um, so it just makes interacting with the chain easier. And we just talked about DAP Kit a little bit. Um, this helps build good mobile experiences. So you can focus on building your mobile DAP um, and you don't have to worry about account management or handling private keys. Um, you can leave that to the Valora wallet or an, another um, Celo wallet that maybe a community member has built. So the idea is um, keys are managed in the Valora wallet and then DAP kit will just defer transaction requests to one of these wallets um, to sign and send transactions or interact with a smart contract or, or whatever it may be. Um, and we have an example application there built on one of our test nets um, with the DAP kit truffle box. Um, we also have Forno, which is an Inferior-like service, if you're familiar with Ethereum development, um, which is just an open service for node access. So you can connect your dApp to the Celo blockchain and you don't have to worry about running a node infrastructure. So just, and Contract Kit is super easy to, to connect to Forno. It's just one line. And you can connect to um, Celo mainnet or any of our test nets. Um, Merrick mentioned Valora which is our uh, C-Labs C -Labs mobile wallet. Um, this 
is a complement to that kit. So it's doing key management. Um, it provides a nice, clean, intuitive UI where users can send transactions and interact with smart contracts. So you don't have to worry about uh, wallet development. Um, Otis is the lightweight identity layer that Merrick was talking about. Um, this is one of the coolest things I think about the Celo blockchain. Um, so it makes it really easy to send cryptocurrency to a phone number. And we have packages in the contract kit that make it easy to look up accounts associated with phone numbers. Um, so you can just do this all programmatically. Um, we also have block explorers for the Alpha Horus testnet, also the Baklova testnet and mainnet. Um, this is really useful for when you're developing applications to verify transactions are going through, um, looking up smart contracts that are on chain, protocol contracts or contracts that you're deploying yourself. Um, Stats.cello.org is an excellent website that I reference regularly. This is more for like protocol level, um, just seeing about the health of the network, seeing how quickly blocks are being produced. Um, you can check like gas price. You can look at the list of validators, um, their signing rate. So if they're missing blocks, all these things. This is more for protocol um, type inspection. I mentioned the Alpha Horus testnet. Um, this is a, a testnet that's just like mainnet, but you can get um, free testnet cello and CUSD from our faucet. Um, Forno also supports connections to Alpha Horus, so you can develop your application on the Alpha Horus testnet. Um, we also have an Alpha Horus cello wallet, which is separate from Valora. Valora is connecting to mainnet by default, so you're using real funds, um, real cello and real CUSD. Um, Alpha Horus, the Alpha Horus wallet um, is no longer in the app store, so if you want to test the mobile applications um, connecting to the Alpha Horus testnet, please reach out to support at clabs.co, um, and then you can um, get an APK or the appropriate package to install on your your testing mobile device. Um, we also have the Baklava testnet, which is more for validators and for testing protocol changes. So um, you guys might not be using this testnet, but just be aware that it exists. And if you want um, to test things more protocol related, Baklava is where you'll go. And we mentioned throughout this talk, um, similarities between Celo and Ethereum. So this means you can use many of the most popular Ethereum developer tools. And Celo supports EVM. So tools for writing smart contracts in Solidity or any language that compiles to EVM bytecode are compatible with Celo. So that means um, ERC-20 tools, uh, NFT tools, and other smart contract interface standards are supported. Um, Celo is a separate layer one, so they're not automatically transferable between chains. But as Merrick mentioned, um, we're working hard on bridges to make this possible. Um, some of the most common Ethereum tools that I've used in conjunction with um, Celo are Truffle. Um, Open Zeppelin contracts are compatible because those are all, um, mostly in Solidity. Um, you can use Remix, which is a Solidity IDE. Um, and if you point that to a Celo node that you're running locally, you can do a lot of the Remix actions directly from, from your uh, Remix IDE. If you guys explore this, um, feel free to reach out to me because Remix was built for Ethereum, so there are some nuances to using it, but um, you can do a lot of really cool things with it. And we also have some really cool things in the works. Um, we are supporting community projects and grants like the a Python and Java SDK. Um, our SDKs are written in JavaScript or TypeScript right now. Um, so these things will be coming out soon. And we're also working on, uh, the community is also working on a web wallet. So. Think about MetaMask, but for Celo, um, so we can access through laptop browsers and things like that. And you can dig into a lot more of this technical info at docs.celo.org. And as I mentioned, join our Discord at chat.celo.org. And I added my email here um, if you guys want to reach out. It's just josh at clabs.co. Um, if you have any questions and you want to talk to me directly, um, Discord or email is a good way to get a hold of me. So thanks, everybody. And I'll hand it back to Rachel. All right, um, Josh, thank you so much. Thank you to both uh, Mark and Josh for joining us uh, today um, with your presentations and um, for the Q&A and to our crowd for joining and asking your really great questions. Um, we do have one more event coming up before camp begins and you'll definitely wanna tune in for this one. 
uh, join us on October 7th for our investors fireside AMA. We have an incredible lineup joining us um, to answer your questions on fundraising. We have Ariana Simpson from Andrusine Horowitz, Ben Persick from Polychain, Ian Lee from IDEO, and So Chi Sasador from C Lab. So you'll be receiving uh, email invites to this event, and I highly encourage you to event uh, to join us and start asking questions as well. And one last reminder before we go, we are almost at the deadline for cell camp applications, which is open till October 5th, and you can apply at cellcamp.com. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Marek and uh, Josh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rachel, for everything. And uh, yeah, uh, go solo camp. <laughs> go camp. Right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.